CS264 um, software design. Now, many of you have, all of you have written programs up until now. You're familiar with several programming languages. I taught you JavaScript last time, and um, you're familiar with Java. You, you, I know a good few of you will have Python experience and, and so forth, um, and probably other languages as well. Um, but up until now, we haven't formally given you any instruction in designing software. And how we might put together a design and how you, 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 you design a solution for something. And the whole purpose of this course is to really give you a sense of design and the importance of design. And we, we introduce a, a language, we could use any language, of course, that you have already, but uh, my preferred option was to give you an extra skill. You know, you're, you're um, in third year now, you're going to be heading to industry for placements and so forth. And so all those extra skills that you have will really help you get those positions you want. So um, we tend to focus a lot on Java early on, um, the web-based technologies, but a huge, huge part that's missing are, um, is C Sharp, okay, which is a Microsoft technology, or C++ and C, type, C technology. Um, so I wanted you to become familiar with that. I mean, it's not a difficult language if you know Java. It's, you know, you, you almost have like, like for like um, commands and instructions. So you should have no problem doing that, but that would be my perspective. Of course, everybody has problems learning something new. I mean, and um, so I, and I do appreciate that, but um, we try to give you the supports that we can along the way and that will, that will help with this. So it's a new language for you. And then you think about design. So one of the other reasons I talk and, uh, about, you know, or I wanted to introduce a new language for you, okay, was because, when you start thinking about designing software, um, you are, and if you're reusing an old language or a language you're familiar with, you can have that habit of just doing things the way I always did. Okay, so having something new means that you learn it in a different way, and you 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 sometimes um, you know understand the bigger concepts around that. I must say to you, of course, that design, real software design, means that you're going to be working with code base in teams and with um, millions of lines of code, okay? So that's why we need to design because when we're building something huge, okay? Um, writing a 10 line program, there's probably not much necessity for design, but writing bigger programs, um, they will um, require some of the design approach. Now you did look at some design last year. We, we touched in, on CS230, we did look at um, model view controller, for example, as an approach to building an online solution, okay? That's kind of a design. Um, but we're going to focus on some commonly used patterns okay, as we work through this. Okay, so that's the basic idea. So if you think about how is that going to impact on me and getting on to this course, it means that the assignments that you get and the programs that you have to build are a little bit bigger than the ones you would have had last time. Okay, You have more time to do these assignments, um, but the code tends to be a little bit bigger, the expectation a little bit bigger in terms of design. Not more complex, but certainly bigger. So you have some sense of how I might put together a design. Okay, and that's the general approach. You know, uh, I get used to, uh, have got used to last year, you know, streaming. Um, although the people who were on the YouTube were very good at interaction and asking questions and stopping them and, and letting me know. If you have a question, stick up your hand, please, and ask. Um, I'm happy to answer questions as I go along. You're not going to interrupt the flow or anything. You know, if it's a burning question for you, it's probably a burning question for somebody else as well. So please feel free to do this. Okay, um, I'm uh, I'm always happy to do that. What I'll do is I'll probably repeat the question so that it's on the it's on the actual recording. So if we're watching back, people will know what was being said. Okay, okay. So today it should be fairly straightforward. He's going. I I don't want any ambiguity about what. You, my expectations are from you for this module, what you, you, you could expect from me, what I'll be doing for you as well. So it's just basically an overview of the module. So here's the plan, okay? It's, if you did CS230 with me last year, then it's very similar, okay? So there's a lecture and a lab overview. We have a schedule of that in the Moodle space. I'm sure you've seen the Moodle space already. If you log in, it's there. Um, what's important to realize that you have two hours of lectures, two hours of laboratories, and one hour of tutorial. So that tutorial is extra for you, and it's meant to help you know, with being able to complete assignments and, um, and your understanding of the material. The continual assessment for this module is 50%, and the summit of two-part examination is 50%. Same as we had with last time with CS230. The examination structures, you'll have a 24-hour coding exam and a one-hour Moodle quiz. As before, 
you know, the the examination will follow on from whatever you've done in class. You know, it's if you if you do your CA, you'll you'll be able to do the assignment, and and we'll come back to that. The Moodle quiz, I will publish the questions in advance. They're more to deal with the te theoretical aspects of the of the course. Um, I always publish all the questions, and then you will know what to expect, and you'll randomly get two of those questions to answer during the quiz. Okay, so it's the same 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 thing. The continual assessment will be based on five 10% assignments. And I think three of them have extra credit options available for an extra 5% on each of those. So it's possible, I think, to gain an extra 15% um, in continual assessment um, for this particular module as well. Okay, so it's worthwhile looking at those and doing some of those. They're 10%. That's quite a lot for an assignment, so they're fairly substantial. They seem to be, in my mind, anyway, spread out fairly well over the actual module. I have an assignment plan and schedule in the actual Moodle space, and you can see when each assignment would be released. In fact, the first assignment's been released already, even though there's no labs this week, um, and we talk a little bit about that later in this lecture as well. Okay. Um, the lecture schedule and lab schedule, so there's going to be 24 lectures over 12 weeks. The basic idea is I do one topic per week, and I give that live lecture, which gives you that overview, and I provide you a five, 10 minute short pre-recorded lessons which give you more detail. There's also all my sample code, all of my working notes in Markdown, and um, anything else that I use. I might make extra recordings and put them there as well, so you, you'll get all of those as well. So everything will be available for you there. Um, there are gonna be 11 laboratories of two hours, and there's also 11 tutorials, and they start in week two, and tutorials are compulsory and labs are compulsory, okay? Um, Please think about what you might like to ask in questions or, or go along to a tutorial, even if you don't have a question, maybe somebody else is going to ask a question. They're not going to give you, Benham um, is the head demonstrator, you know, as he was for CS230, you're familiar with the man. Um, super, super support for my module in this module as well. And he will um, be also taking the tutorials. So you can ask questions. You can probably mail them in advance saying, is there any chance you might be able to cover something? Do this. He won't give actual answers or solutions to assignments. We don't give answers directly like this. But you know, we can give small segments that would be helpful, but not actually the actual solutions, okay? Um, because we don't do that at all, okay? And as I said, the, um, the schedule is available as a PDF Moodle. We have a look at that. I may change the schedule depending on how it goes, you know? Um, I always, always think we can do more than we can actually do a lot of the time. You know, I'm kind of a bit ambitious in that regard. Um, if I think things are going a bit or too too detailed or something, I'll try to roll back a little bit, you know? Or I might speed up, but that's unlikely I'll end up speeding up because I tend to be speeding up anyway. Um, so I just, I may need to slow down a little bit and, and maybe revise it just a little bit. There are four main sections in this. Um, module. We'll have a look at that in a second. The initial part, anyway, for the first six sessions is to focus and become expert in C Sharp. And then the second half will be looking at building and designing software and software design patterns. Okay. Everything you learn in relation to C Sharp can also apply to other languages, um, mostly object oriented languages, okay, because a lot of the models and design patterns, in fact, the design patterns came from, say, you know, object oriented design and development. So like back as far as a language called Smalltalk, you know, C++, Java, of course, and a lot of the modern patterns you would see related to building software with Java. But we can do that with C Sharp as well, and C++. Okay, and then we get on to the design patterns. I'd probably switch over just to have a look at those documents um, in a few minutes, but these, this is a summary of these. Um, so if you go to the Moodle space, you'll see these documents, these are key. The one on the left image gives you the schedule. Chooses a really busy day in terms of CS264 for you guys, okay? Really busy. Um, there's no tutorial today, okay, obviously. Um, no labs today. Um, there's a lecture tomorrow, but that's the pre-recorded. It'll be put online. It may go on before the 10 o'clock, but if, I'll probably put it on whenever I get up in the morning or something, you know, but it'll be there for you. The laboratory schedule is, um, it's really important, I guess, you know, so that you know when the assignments are. So, um, you know, you've got two weeks for the first assignment, but you've essentially got three weeks because you've got this week as well. OK, so you, you can think about the assignment. Um, and this is the schedule of lectures. So, you know what you'll be doing in every week. OK, and all, all of the topics. OK, so I guess what's important um, really is that 
we can have a look at this in a second, but also I wanted to tell you about the tools that we will use because we will use online tools and stuff for, for this as well. So we're going to use, um, Moodle will be the jumping off point for all content. So if you go to Moodle space, that's where you should be able to find where the stuff is. Um, I'm going to use Teams if I need to make some announcements for the class because it's, I don't have to worry about mailing lists. I can just make sure everybody gets something and it's also recorded and it's there and you can see the thread of things. So any changes or updates, I'll, I'll ask there. OK, and um, I'll also use teams for meetings if students want to come and meet me or talk to me. The, prefer the preferred option now in this post COVID scenario is to use teams for meetings. OK, and um, that's because if we want to meet here, we have to be masked for around about one meter and it's quite public here as well. And um, um, if we don't use masks and some of you may not be, you know, in a position to be able to use masks for interactions, um, then we have to have two meter distance and we can't really have a private chat over two, two meters, okay? Um, I can meet you outside. I can see you, you know, um, in outside areas or wherever. Um, if you do feel you want to come and talk to me in person, you know, it's no problem with that. Um, I, I don't have an issue with meeting you in person. I'd probably end up having to wear a mask myself because I'm, I have a medical condition that makes me high risk. So, so I tend to just do it for the moment, okay? Um, until I see how it goes. Um, but uh, the university says that the preferred option is to meet online. So we can schedule meetings and I'll talk to you in Teams, okay? But then the problem is if you're here, you might not have a space where you can actually use Teams in a way that's good for you, okay? But we'll find a way. Don't, we won't let technologies or, whatever is involved in, you know, practice or rules, get in the way of you learning or understanding and being able to have a question and answer, okay? If you have problems, come and see me, okay? Um, I'll put all my recordings onto YouTube and then we'll, we'll uh, I'll give you the links to those from within, from within that. I have a YouTube channel, as you know. Um, I'm also going to use Mentimeter for polls, okay? Did I use Mentimeter with you guys last year? No, yes, yeah, okay. So some of you may have seen them, some of you not, but just to remind you, we'll, we'll probably see those. Okay, so let's have a quick pick, peek at some of these. Um, so this is uh, this is the schedule, okay? So the first three weeks, we're going to be today, this is the module overview. Next week, we're going to be looking at the fundamentals of software development with C-sharp. Um, and uh, it's very straightforward. If you want to jump ahead, and start thinking about assignments and so forth, I'll give you a link of nice tutorials at the end of this class. It's on a slide. You can click through to those. Oh, I'll also PDF all the slides and put those online as well. So you, you, you'll have everything. You know, I know, I know that not everybody wants to look at a video again, you know, um, but they, um, they do want to have slides, so that's fine. And I'm not sure what you watch, but I always watch videos at 1.5 speed on YouTube, you know, <laughs> at least, you know, I'm, I'm too lazy, you know, to sit and give time, even listen to my, and I don't like listening to myself, but I have to listen to all my own videos. It's just to be sure how it works. But anyway, so next week we go to the C sharp stuff and then we're going to have a look at object oriented concepts and see how we might bring them in C sharp into that, you know, and then we're going to focus almost exclusively on object oriented programming and advanced concepts in C sharp. And then, um, you know, some of the, some of the things that make C sharp, really cool, like generics and link and stuff, you know? So you can do really cool stuff with C-sharp, so it'd be a shame not to know how to do those. So we'll, we'll get to those. Um, and then we're gonna work into um, this week here, uh, this section here on um, design patterns and then more design patterns, okay? So there's a lot of that stuff, okay? So we'll, we'll, we'll be delighted to get to that, okay? Um, at some point, um, if we look at the, um, if we look at the module itself, I have too many apps open. So here is the Moodle page, as I said already. Um, all the details you need are here. Everything is uh, here, a lot to read, okay? I'm, I mean, my TLDR is read everything, okay? Um, because the questions are there. Um, there's no shortcut in this. Just please read and understand what goes on here. Um, so this is the course finder. The, the teaching schedule is here, the lecture topics are here, the laboratory and assignment schedule is here. That's um, really important stuff. You need to know when your assignments are due. It also tells you a little bit about how it works and um, and so forth, and the whole point of how you get your CA. Um, it's important that you look at that. Um, the This is my view. I see all the stuff that's hidden. You, you probably know stuff similar, you can't see it, but um, so your first assignment is here already. The submission is hidden for extra credit is hidden, assignment two, 
three, four, every, everything is ready to go for you, they'll automatically become available, okay? So you, you, they're there, they're done. I may make changes to this in a little while. Um, week one, um, these are hidden from you at the moment because obviously I've hidden them because I may I need to change the recording and put something up. So there are placeholders to put everything there, but every, every, everything is here. Um, the files will be here, all the files I use in the demo today and everywhere else. So everything, everything is here. All the weeks are here and all the information about the exams are, are here as well. So all of these will become available on a weekly basis. So you should have everything and feel that everything is planned. And I know what I'm having you to do. I want you to know what's expected of you as well, okay? But if you find, sometimes I, I know myself as well, when I see what's ahead of me, what needs to be done, sometimes it can become overwhelming, okay? I know some people love to know, oh, this is what I'm going to do now, now, now. But then some people just go, I can't believe I've got to do all this stuff and so much to do, especially in day one, right? And it can be a bit overwhelming. So I release it a little bit at a time, um, but we have to have a plan. You know, I need to know where you're going to go and I hope you would be happy with knowing where you're going to go as well. So we, we, we work from there. Okay, so everything everything should be helpful. In terms of labs, um, I've got two lab groups, okay? Um, because there's two, two um, lab sessions one from one to three on Tuesdays. Then there's a break, there's a tutorial, and then there's a, a, a lab afterwards from four to six. I have randomly allocated people to, um, to the Ash group and to the Oak group, okay? So you'll be able to find which group you're in, okay? And which group you're not in, okay? It's by just logging into Moodle and seeing which group I'm in. That, the Ash is the earlier lab and the Oak is the later lab. May not suit you, Maybe let us know and we can move you around. Okay? Okay? There's room to move you around. I think because of the spacing in the lab, we, in principle, we, we used to be able to fit everybody in one lab, you know, but, but with all the space restrictions, we have to split you and have two labs. Okay? So um, let us know if there's a problem and we can try to move you about. Okay? But we, you, you have to appreciate that we have constraints. We, I have to have a good reason probably for moving you, like you know, if you can't get home or something like this, you know, then obviously you know, if the bus leaves at five, you know, that's the problem, you know, but um, you can't back to, get back down the country or something, then we'll have to move you to the earlier one, but we try to balance the number of people in the labs because we just have to, okay? Any questions so far, please? No? Okay. Um, okay, so I think we've done this. Um, I did mention that YouTube channel is there. You can still see some of the dreaded CS230 stuff. Um, a lot of 264 material in there from previous versions, but there may be updated versions there. So, um, I'll, I'll, but I'll give you the link to the version I want you to use, okay? And you can have a look at this. Um, and of course, I'll be I'll be using uh, Mentimeter, um, as I said already. Um, so, you know, you can, we'll have some polls and you can have a look at those polls. And then you, the, the issue is that there will be code up here. If you go to menti.com, type this code and you'll be able to, um, use this or you can download that app and use them. So we might have some polls as we work along. So it's a useful as well to have. Okay. So this is the question I get asked quite a bit. Well, actually I get always get asked it in the negative form. Okay. You know, you know, it's like, you know, sometimes I get asked, well, why did I fail CS264? Okay. I don't like to dwell on the negatives or, or how, why did I, not many people fail. Okay, so I think last year I had a two percent failure rate. You know, like <laughs> in fact, there was only less than ten percent failure rate for CS two thirty. You know, hard courses, a lot of material. People really step up, do a great job, but still people don't pass. Okay, so so I like to think about it the other way around because I gave one hundred. We also last year we had more people got a hundred percent than failed. Okay in my modules, same with CS264, okay? So I like to think in terms of, well, how can I do really well in CS264 in my modules? And this is the mindset you have to have. What do I need to do to be able to achieve that 100%? Because each and every one of you is capable of doing this, okay? It's about work. It's always about work and putting in the time, you know? And if you have issues, try to fix those issues and ask, we're here to help, you know? We want you to get one. I want to see my students get, 100%, you know, I want you to be able to save 100% in your transcript and go to a company when you're applying, say, I can design software. Okay. I want this for you. You should want that for you as well. Okay. 
the biggest, biggest problem that we have for people, the people who do well are the people who attempt all of the continual um, assessment. I always give opportunities to people to resubmit if something went wrong or they had a bad time or they were unwell or there was something in their life that got in the way of them not doing as well as they possibly could do. Okay, just talk to me. We sort that out. Okay, don't wait until you know two days before the repeat exam and say, I didn't do assignment four. You know, do the assignments when you can. If you can't, we might need extra time. Do them then. Okay, we we'll, we'll, we can do this. But if you do all the assignments and work some, that will scaffold you. Okay, and help you be able to do something. You'll gain marks early on. The amount of people like you know who feel great about going into an exam, having already passed the module, makes them more confident. You know, they're confident about doing the assignment, doing the exam. Really, and that confidence is hugely, hugely important in your terms of your performance. You need to start believing in yourselves and being confident in your abilities. And just doing some CA. And even if you make a mistake and don't get 100% CA, you've done it. You've learned something from it. You, know, you learn from your mistakes all the time. I learn, all, I'm learning every day, you know, you know, all the time, you know. I mean, I, I, I'm interested in martial arts. You know, and I do yoga, you know, these are things that make me feel good about not being in the classroom, you know, and every day, you know, I make mistakes, you know, you know, I'm, something happens to me, like, you know, or if I do a pose in yoga and, you know, I've done this pose hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times, my instructor will say to me, you need to do a little bit better there, John, you need to stretch your leg, you need to do something, stop bending, hold your back, stop breathing, stop holding your breath, all those things. If you're not making mistakes, you're not learning, okay? Bottom line, make mistakes, be happy about the fact that you've made so, and, and then be delighted about the fact that you fixed that mistake. So the CA provides you with this opportunity to actually engage deeply with topics and you're solving problems in coding and design a little bit later, and it's a paced manner that helps and increases your understanding and competence over time. You're not going to be good immediately. If you were, you wouldn't need to do this module. Okay, right, so, so embrace that and learn this. So the assignments also give very high marks, okay? But they also prepare you for the summit of exam. And it's really based on those assignments. And the high performance in your continual assessment often leads to high performance overall, in my experience. Stressors sometimes get in the way. People get overwhelmed by the fact that they've got an exam, you know? And that, even if they're good, that can... So, you know, if, you, if you're feeling like this, come and talk to me about it as well, okay? There's no problem with that. If you're struggling, please, please ask for help. Just don't struggle and or suffer in silence okay we all understand you know that how, how people feel so please please get in contact but right, we're going to be developing software using um any questions before i move on because that's kind of all the background stuff i want to talk a little bit about development now because this is computer science and software engineering after all any questions no okay all right we're going to be developing with the um the .NET framework so that means you're going to have to install .NET framework onto your machine i'm a mac user it's, it works for me. I have Linux, works for me. I have Windows, it works for me. Everything, the same tools work across the way. I use VS Code. Um, you have to install, if you're using Linux, you have to install Mono um, in order to make it work. But I've given some instructions on how to do all of that in the pre-recorded lessons, which will follow tomorrow. So you should be, whatever operating system you use, you should be able to, to install with those. Um, I've tested a lot of the stuff that I have and it works. Um, I use Visual Studio Code, VS Code, that IDE rather than Visual Studio itself, because it's too big for what I need. You know, I just have them a minimal setup, but you can use Visual Studio if you wish for this. Um, and I've just installed all the, the, the tools, but you, you kind of have to have, um, you must have something like Visual, uh, Vis Visual Studio um, in order to be able to replicate exactly what I'm doing, okay? But you don't have to have it installed if you just want to do and play your, your own way, okay? You know, people have preferences. Um, this is a very simple, um, program, um, hello world program. You'll notice that it looks very like Java, okay? Very, very similar to Java. If you remember back to Java, you did Java last year with the with the um, data structures and algorithms, yeah, yeah, okay. It's very similar to this, okay? Um, it's it's uh, not too bad. I'll explain what's happening here. So the first thing we need to do is um, you have to declare this um, this namespace. Okay, and namespaces um, provide you with a set of functions and methods, but also with the names of all of those methods and so forth, so that you can use them in your in your application. 
This then, we actually create our own namespace here for your app, and I've called it my app, and it clears a, a name, uh, just a namespace. Okay. Then we C sharp is inherently object based. Okay. Yeah. So you, uh, uh, when you learned Java, I think you you did objects late. I think you know you you were introduced to the whole notion of object oriented stuff after you'd learned a little bit about the programming. Yeah. So it's not my preferred way to program. I like objects first approach. Um, when I taught Java way, way, way back when it was first invented, I always went object first, you know, so um, so I'd be using this object first approach with this. So you understand that everything has to be of a class. And I look at the world as a, as a, as a, a set of interacting objects that communicate via message passing, okay? Human interaction, objects, message passing, talking, you know, waving, hello, semiotics, all, all that stuff. It's all about interacting objects. And so we start with objects straight away. So we have this program, um, unimaginatively called program, and you'll see why shortly. Um, then we have this static method called um, main. It takes a bunch of arguments, which we're not gonna use here, okay? Um, but you'll see that it's a static method. And you know what a static method is? Yes, no, yes, remember, it's not a, it's a method that's associated with a class, it can be called from within a class. You don't have to instantiate an object in order to be able to, to, to call that method yeah so it's a class method okay um then we have um, a data type it's a string and here's a string variable and here's the value of that variable and we have uh, another method that writes to the console and this console is an object that was imported or a class that was imported from within system okay so that's where it comes from okay if we didn't have if we didn't import system here or use say we were using this namespace we would have had to write system.console so that's you know the practical things and um, so that's quite straightforward you'll notice that um on my slides here i you'll, you'll see this demo thing okay on the top corner of this of my slides um for cs264 that means that there will be the demo code will be available Okay, so you know you can go to the space to the files, and you'll be able to have a look at um, you'll be able to have a look at all of the files that were created. Okay, so here's CS two six four live lectures week one. Here is all of the stuff that I'm giving you in week one. Okay, there's some extra stuff here, but but basically you can see that there's a program here. Okay, so anything, any code I I give you will see. So let's let's see how we we do this. So I use um, okay Visual Studio Code. Here's a program that I've written already. But let's close this one. So I'm using the terminal here, um, the shell in Visual Studio Code. I'm in the directory. I want to create my first Hello World program. Okay. So the way to do this. .NET, new console. .NET new console means we're creating a new console application. You can tell it what framework to use, 5.0, 5.1, whatever. Um, and I've created this, this app. Okay, and you'll notice that up here, I've created this program, this whole app called my app. And you'll see the code is here, program.cs. And this is where that program comes from. Okay. Okay. So you can generate a program, a starting shell of a program as simply as this. In order to run the program, we can, I'm back down in the console again here. You can do .NET. Oh, we need to go into the directory CD. Okay. And you'll see that the program is here. I'll just stop. Hello world. Okay, that's when it all works. You'll get errors. Everybody gets errors. We love errors. So um, save this. We got this error.
and it tells me here doesn't include a definition for outline okay so we know what the error was we fixed the error Run. okay guys don't be afraid of errors you know those red things tell you everybody makes mistakes you know and with time as you become better developers you make fewer errors per hour than you did the previous week and the previous week and the previous year okay the whole object of becoming a better developer is that you don't go through this write a line of code run and test write a line of code run and test you know you get to the point where you write 10 lines of code you write 20 lines of code 50 lines of code and then you run and you don't get errors so you get some errors so so measures of you as an improving developer are i can write more lines of code in a 10 minute period and make fewer errors i don't have to keep testing because this whole run test debug process takes up a lot of time Okay? And it's not very productive. And it's something you should really know and have some sense about. And I, I'd, if I was you, I'd start recording that information about myself now. You know, because somebody will say to you when you go to an interview for your placements, well, you know, can you code? How good are you? You know, and you say, well, I can write about 100 lines of C sharp, make about two errors, and do this within 10, 15 minutes. You know, that's a real confidence inspiring piece of information that you can tell about yourself to a prospective employer, okay? Because the, the question will say, well, why should I choose you over you? Or you over you, whatever, you know? I mean, you say, well, or, or how do I choose you over the next one? You say, well, I can write code and I don't make mistakes. You know, if I do make mistakes, I make few of them. And when I make mistakes, I can correct them like this, okay? So these are the kinds of skills as third year students who are embarking, getting closer to getting a job, you need to be thinking about. Okay, and you're all very well capable of doing this. Um, always read the R. Don't just be frightened by the fact that this is oh. And sometimes you get warnings. Read the warnings too. Okay, they're there for a reason. Okay, they're there to help you and help you fix these things. Okay, have a bring this maturity to your development in this module. Any questions so far? Yes. The run sequence? Or to create this? Okay, yeah, of course, yeah. So what I did here in, in the terminal was that .NET allows you to create a, a new application, okay? So what we're seeing here, it's a good question, okay? Really good question. What we're seeing here is just the code that we run. But in order for it to actually run, you need to have the, the runtime environment information around that. Okay, and if we look here, we have to have all this. This it create, also creates this directory, an object directory and a binary directory. And we can look inside those and we can see there's lots of information about the build and all the information that we would have. So when we create an app, in C sharp, we need to create all of this stuff, not just the code. So we have to create this environment, give it a framework, tell it what we're going to use, what tools we're going to use, all that stuff. Remember when we worked with Node.js, we were adding environments and so forth. So the .NET command essentially allows us to be able to do all of that stuff. Okay? It just creates a default skeleton code called program.cs that we can actually use then, and we can modify that and change that for the app that we want to build. Okay? So when you did Java, if you think about Java, you, did, you had two commands that were, were core. You, had, you edited something, you did javac, which compiled, and that generated all of the compiled code for you. And then you, ran, you, 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 you called Java on the piece of code, and that ran, that was the runtime environment that allowed you to be able to do this. Okay, so the .NET app kind of merges both of these into the one. So .NET create, and then just .NET to run. So the .NET create console, or .NET, essentially, dot .NET, and the create is .NET new console. You might want to write a RESTful API, for example. You might want to write something else with, uh, with .NET, um, rather than a console application. And it will allow you to do all that as well, okay? And so the whole point of the .NET command is to roll everything into just a single command that we can run. So it's both the compiler and the runtime environment with a single command. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Great question. And and, and I forget some of these things to do, to, do, to to explain it in detail. But um, that's super. Any other questions? 
Yes. Um, if I, yeah, I, I, it doesn't really matter because I think the kind, uh, the question again is, does the does the framework matter? Um, I always have the latest framework and update the latest framework. I just do it, you know, and hopefully everything will work. And but uh, and and I've been doing this for a while. So the kinds of programs that we're working and using with at the console level tends not to be tends not to be an issue. Now I've um, I don't really worry about some of the, the fancier stuff, you know. I mean, there are database issues. There, if you wanted to work with databases, then there are. Um, I find that there are some issues around the different frameworks, and also in relation to the different operating systems. So, trying to do um, some of the database stuff with um, with on Mac with Visual Studio Code rather than Visual Studio. It's a bit of arduous, okay? You have a lot of manual work to do yourself. Um, also, uh, it differs in terms of what, what, what works on Mac and what works on and Linux and on Windows, because it's a Windows development primarily, okay? So um, it shouldn't matter too much. Whatever you have should work, okay? Okay. Any further questions? Okay, so that's... Um, that's the uh, the basics. I mean, you'll see here's a another small um, app. Uh, I've one called Week One app, so I can move in here. I need to um, I need to change directory here. And it's uh, you'll notice there's this project file created as well, so it's fine. Let me have a look at this this program, and it's a simple program again that just declares variables, reads and writes. Okay, so you can you know we can you can just switch directories and you can just do so you know it's uh unimaginative stuff okay but you have to start somewhere right and um and uh sometimes having something that works and tests is fine and, and as our friend mentioned in terms of framework sometimes it's a good idea just to take some of the stuff that i have and see that they run if they don't run then maybe there's something amiss with your setups. Okay, so that's probably a good idea to do this. Okay, so let's see where we are in terms of what we need to cover today. Okay, so generally when I work with these these particular um, with C sharp, this kind of you'll see a lot of these kind of screens where there's code and yellow bar or pink bars letting you know what's what what's what. Okay, should help maybe have a look at those as well. Okay, so we saw. Um, the Hello World app, I mean, you asked the question, this is the actual, these are the steps, I guess, and you should see, and just, I've just captured some of the screen so you can um, just remember, that's okay. You'll notice I've, I've made an error here. I've deliberately had an error here because you have to remember to go into the direct, correct directory in order to be able to run it, okay? Yeah, so it's just something. I said, nothing wrong with errors as long as you're learning something from them, okay? So I leave the error, correct it, and then it works. So sometimes you'll see a bit of that because I mean, you know, this is getting complex. So we do need to be able to know how to do stuff like this. So um, as you're aware, um, I, I, I do work with Markdown um, a lot. Um, so I share all my notes that I have with you. Um, it's a, it's a, always do this. Um, I tend to use the Atom editor for my Markdown because sometimes I like to have switch between two applications. I've got all my code in one. VS Code, and I tend to have all my documentation in Atom, but everything that I do in Atom, you can do in VS Code if you just want to install a single editor, okay? Um, so all the files would be there. Um, I give all my code, uh, you know, quite happy to give every code I've written. Um, I give notes, and again, they'll be all on Moodle and, and, and YouTube. Um, if, you, if we have a quick look, I have Atom running here. So this is... Um, Actually, this is an extra lecture that I've made, lecture lessons. Just to me, it's like life skills stuff, you know? Have, have you come across SVGs as graphics? Yeah, you've seen them, okay. So I tend to give it, my second assignment is about manipulating SVGs or doing work with SVGs, okay? Because they're text-based files, basically. They're images, but they're text-based and they're vectors, okay? So it's the second assignment, so it won't happen for, well, three, four <laughs> weeks at this stage. But so I decided I would, um, 
And a lot of the times students and previously have had difficulty because they've got to learn about SVGs and, and do the assignment and learn C sharp and it becomes a bit overwhelming. So what I've done is I've I've written you a rather than having to go to search the web, I've written you a document on how to make SVGs and um and it's here. So you can see the mark then is on the left. Um some examples. Um we're gonna look at building and making emoji, or this is a Kamoji from Japanese Kamoji. Um and um so I'll show you how to build all that stuff, okay? Um, so I'll share this. Again, it's written in Markdown. All the code is there. Everything is there for you to, to play with. Um, so we should be able to, and because it's kind of follows on from your web, you're all web dev uh, experts at this stage, um, you know, I basically show you how to, how to uh, do this kind of stuff, okay? Um, with, uh, Okay, so this is an interactive SVG. Okay, so it's a vector graphic that's done controlled by JavaScript and, and, and so forth. So, so we can, uh, so all of the code, and I'll give you a link to that video and the code so that you can prep for assignment two. Okay, so it's probably a good thing to do. But anyway, that's a Andrew, but again, as I say, everything will be in active. So you need to be able to be able to read my markdown files. And if you hadn't done it up until now, then please. Um, please install a Markdown Previewer, okay? Um, okay. If you want to get started with C-sharp, um, uh, I'd recommend um, these links. Um, they're, they're pretty good. Um, I, think, I think these were, I think they're links. They should be links. <laughs> Maybe they're not links. <laughs> I'll have to update it and put it in. But you, if you search, there's a most of the most of the documentation, and really the documentation from Microsoft and the Microsoft Developer Network MDN. Um, I know you um, looked at the the um, we looked at the Mozilla Mozilla framework documents a lot when we were working with web dev. Okay, so I'd recommend you use the Microsoft and .NET documentation really, really excellent. You can literally copy and paste code. And I'm happy with you copying and pasting and using that code that's available in the documentation and modifying it for assignments and so forth. Okay, I have no problem with doing that. Just say I'm using this. Okay, it's absolutely fine, you know, to use code that you're learning from. Okay, so you want to copy assignments from last year or solutions, because some of the assignments will be, will be similar to last year's ones. There'll be subtle differences. We often catch the subtle differences with students who submit an assignment from one of their friends in the year ahead, and actually they forget that the assignment has changed slightly, and then you know, then it becomes a mess, right? You know, for everybody having to deal with all this stuff. So try do the assignment yourself. But the 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 examples here, their tutorial on creating a simple console app is really really excellent. It is it does deal with Visual Studio, but you, there's one for Visual. You could just use it in Visual Studio Code a lot of it as well. And um, there's a great tutorial on C sharp um, on W3 schools. Um, uh, if you want to look at how to run these programs in VS Code, you could have a peek here. Um, uh, you can. There's another link on C sharp. These aren't links, unfortunately. I, I did make links, but I have them somewhere. Um, and then how to create um, something else. How to create and debug a program or that not console application. So you could have a look at some of those. Okay. I mentioned that the first assignments, um, the first assignment is up already and available in Moodle. Okay, um, you may have seen it. Have you seen this assignment appearing yet? Nope, it's there. Okay, um, so um, they will all appear um, when they're supposed to. I hope um, it's based on converting between different forms of table representation for a number of different human readable formats. So CSV format, okay, um, Markdown format for tables. JSON and HTML. Now you you're probably not familiar with Markdown tables, okay? Um, it's the rest of them you will know how to do, or how you might represent a table in JSON, or you might represent something in in HTML using the table command. I know we can represent tables if you like with the div commands as well, so it's less the divs and so forth. But um, so I think then that's that's the assignment, and to be able to switch between these formats. So we have to. There's a little bit of design work going on here. Because you have to figure out, well, how do I represent a table internally? How do I convert from one table 
to type to another table type. Okay, that becomes tricky. You say, oh, do I have to do parsers? We haven't done compilers yet, or any of this kind of stuff. You know, well, there are simple ways that you can to do this, and a lot of it relies on you having a clever design. Okay, and thinking about how you might design something. So one of the ways to do it is to have a table and have an internal representation from the table, and then do a generation from that. So you have a generator from the internal representation. So you could use a, a kind of a table essentially an array, okay? And you could actually work from there. You might want to use hash tables. You might want to use lists or, or lists of lists or something for these things, depending on that. But simple rectangular tables can be represented as an array. As long as you get it into an array, you can generate a generator for each of these, okay? That's how you might approach that assignment, okay? So that's what I mean in terms of design. You have to look for a good design in addition to being able to do the coding. So you'll need to be competent in basic C Sharp to complete it successfully. That means you need to know how to do file handling, command line processing, data structures, mostly just arrays, string handling, iteration, like all the things, okay? <laughs> all the stuff you're gonna need for yourself. You have to, you'll come up to speed fairly quickly. And this is the basic stuff because you could think about, think about how you might solve this with Java. You can pretty much have an analogous piece of code in C Sharp, okay? You're also going to have to familiarize or refamiliarize yourself with the language formats. I'd, I'd actually look at the table online generator converter. I have I, I use this one all the time. Okay. So here's a table generator. So that's is, this is how you would see this table up here. You know, you can edit this. You know, this is like title, and it just shows you how you could generate the markdown corresponding to this. Yeah. Nice. If you want to see how this works in CSV, it looks like this. JSON it looks like this. HTML looks like this. Okay. So it's a really, really nice online tool, tableconvert.com, that shows you how to do table conversions, you know, and get a sense of those. So it's doing the work, you know, it's essentially doing all this work that I'm asking you to do with command line. Yeah. So you could look at the design of this because you can read html guys right and you can read javascript so you should be able to figure out one way that's one way to solve this problem or you could do some research and figure out how to do it look at libraries all that kind of thing so it's it might seem a bit overwhelming at first this assignment but because oh i don't know about this stuff but actually it's not it's not too difficult okay so um and it's okay it's perfectly okay to go to look at resources like this and get some help and figure out how to do this okay that's not cheating. It's just, you know, solving a problem, you know, and uh, and that's something you should be able to do without difficulty. So we're just about finished, but I'll just pop back to the slides there. Um, for assignment two, as I said, you're also going to know a little bit about scalar vector graphics, and I've made a little video to help with that. I'll post it to Moodle when the time appears. I don't want to overburden you either, and, um, and uh, thank you for coming to the lecture. It was great to have you here. It's lovely to see real people, and um, do keep in touch, okay? Thank you very much.